Welcome back to your physics notes. What we're going to talk about today is using solving one-dimensional kinematics problems. Now, my trick for this, um, these problems can get kind of messy, and there's usually tricks inside the problem, so you want the actual, you want to have a formulaic way of solving them. So what I tend to use is something called the guess method. Now, it doesn't mean you just guess on the answer. The letters G-U-E-S-S -S stand for the steps you use to solve the problem. So real quick, just to show you what the guess method is, the letter G stands for givens. So your first step in a kinematics problem is to identify the givens. The U stands for unknowns. The E stands for equation. The S stands for solve, and the other S stands for substitute. For, so, for example, let's say I give you a situation where I tell you how fast something starts out moving, I tell you how far it goes, and I want to know what its final velocity is. You would identify the items that I give you. You would then figure out what you don't know, and some of those might be what I'm asking you to find, but others might just be things you just don't know, but it doesn't matter. Then you find an equation, or you develop an equation, that you can use to find the unknown that you're looking for with the givens that I gave you. Then you solve that equation for your unknown without numbers in it. Then you substitute in your numbers and you plug it into your calculator and you get a final solution. So now, here's a sample problem. Now, I'll be honest with you, I chose a, a pretty challenging one right off the bat. So it gives you a description of a lady driving in her car. She sees a dog on the road in front of her. It takes her a second, almost a second, to uh, get her foot down on the brake. And once that happens, she starts decelerating. It gives you an acceleration. And it asks you how far does it she travel before she stops. So the reason this is trickier than normal is if you read the problem carefully and you think about it in terms of a graph, if this is a velocity versus time graph, you would notice that it says that she's driving and it takes 0.7 seconds for her foot to hit the, the brake pedal. So she's going to have a period of her motion where she's moving at a constant velocity. Then her foot hits the brake pedal and she starts to slow down at a constant acceleration. So if you remember to what we've been talking about in class, it's asking for the change in position. So if you were able to find this area and this area, that would equal her change in position. So there's a couple different ways you can do that. You have this time is 0.7 seconds. So you can find this area right here by multiplying her velocity times the time. So that would be whatever 100 kilometers per hour is in meters per second, of course. Um, so that would give me this first region. Now this region is a little trickier, though, because notice it didn't tell me how long it took her to stop. If I knew this length, I could just find the area of that triangle. I don't know that length, so I'm going to have to use my kin and max equations which we'll get to in a second. But first, let's go ahead and uh, solve this first part, the part where she's moving at a constant velocity, because that's as simple as multiplying that velocity times the time to find this area, okay? So the first thing we have to do is we have to convert this 100 kilometers per hour to meters per second. So if you don't remember how to do this, um, if you think back to chemistry class, this is a unit conversion problem. So what you do is you write 100 kilometers per hour and then what you want to do is you want to cancel the units, okay? So to do that, you're going to multiply this number by some other fraction that is essentially equal to the number 1. So remember, any fraction is equal to 1 if what's on the top is equal to what's on the bottom. So what I want to do is I want first kilometers to cancel. I'm just picking that. So I'm going to want kilometers to be on the bottom of this fraction because now if I multiply that, those two units are going to cancel. And I want to convert that to meters. So the question is, how many meters is equal to a certain number of kilometers? Well, I know that one kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. The prefix kilo means one thousand. So if I multiply this out now, that will cancel with that, and the units that are left are meters and hours. Now, I don't want meters and hours, I want meters per second. So now I need to convert the hours to seconds. To do that, I'm just gonna keep going. Now I want hours to cancel, so I'm gonna put that on top. I know that there's a relationship between hours and minutes, one hour, 60 minutes. These two things are equal. That is equal to that, so this is just multiplying by the number one. 
And you notice if I did that, this would cancel with this, and I would wind up with units now of meters per minute. I don't want meters per minute, I want meters per second, so I gotta do it one more time. I want minutes to cancel, and I want seconds. One minute, 60 seconds. Now if I do the math and I plug everything in, that minutes would cancel with that minutes. The only units that are left are meters and seconds, which is what I want, which means now what I have to do is just plug this into a calculator, multiply the whole top together over the whole bottom together and get an answer. And if I do that, I get my velocity is equal to 27.8 meters per second. So what I did was I just multiplied 100 times 1,000 times 1 times 1, and then I divided that by whatever the quantity 1 times 1 times 60 times 60 is, which is, uh, what, 360 or 3,600? So, and then I get 27.8 meters per second. So now, if I go back to my guess method, I now know what my givens are. So my givens are the velocity is equal to 27.8 meters per second. And I'm also given the time, which is 0 0.7 seconds. Those are my givens. And then my unknowns, the U in the guess, is the change in position. And I know that that change in position is going to be equal to the area in this section of the graph. So now the equation part comes in. You have a couple different options here for picking an equation. You can remember the equation velocity equals change in position over time, or you can just develop your own equation by looking at that area and saying, well, it's a rectangle, so the area of the rectangle, which is change in position, is velocity times time. It's that base times height right there, okay? So my equation is going to be delta x equals velocity times time, okay? And there's no real... Uh, solution rearranging or anything to do for that so now I just plug in my numbers and I get an answer so for that first part of the motion I would get 27.8 meters per second times 0 0.7 seconds and always look at your units if I multiply meters per second times second the seconds are going to cancel and I'm going to meters if I multiply that out I get a solution of 19.5 five meters. So now that's not my answer to the whole problem, but that is the answer to the first region of that graph right there. Okay. So now that I know that, I can start to solve the rest of it. So now that I have that portion, let's just set that aside and let's start solving the rest of this problem here. Okay. So I'm just going to put it over here. So now if I look at the rest of it, um, now I'm looking at the region of the graph that I just made it super tiny, I'm sorry, but the part that's a triangle on here, okay? So again, whenever, here's where it turns into more of a classic kinematics problem. I now have a situation where I have a certain starting velocity, starting position, um, I, a certain amount of time goes by, and I have a constant acceleration. So when I do this, what I generally do is I write down just this basic table, and I'm going to fill out all of my values. So I have initial velocity, I have final velocity, I have acceleration, I have time, I have my initial position, your final position, or depending on how you're going to solve the problem, you can just put change in position, okay? Sometimes you might want to break that up into x initial and x final, but that's up to you. So now what do I know starting out? Well, I know my initial velocity, it's the same as it was in the beginning, in the, in the first part of the problem, is 27.8 meters per second. And that's to the right, so I'm going to say that to the right is positive. What's my final velocity? It doesn't say it in the problem, but it tells you that the car stops. So I do know my final velocity, it's zero. And then the acceleration, it tells me is 8.2 meters per second squared. And since that's causing me to slow down, it must be pointed the opposite direction of my velocity. And since my velocity was positive, that means that's gonna be negative. Time is an unknown, I don't know what that is. And delta x is also an unknown. So I have two unknowns, so right now I've identified my givens and my unknowns. The next step is to choose an equation that would work for solving this problem. So if I go back to my three kinematics equations, 
which uh, are, have been in previous videos and we've derived from velocity versus time graphs. Okay. The question is, which one of these can I use to solve for the unknown that I'm looking for, which is change in position? Okay. So first of all, take a look at the first one. Remember, I'm looking for change in position, and in that problem, in that equation, I don't have change in position. So I could use this to solve for t if I wanted to, but I don't really, I'm not looking for t. I might have to find it if there's no other way to do it, to find t first. But as far as I'm concerned, that's kind of useless right now. The next one has change in position, which I need, okay? And then the question is, do I have all the other things in the equation? So if you look, the first thing I come to is acceleration. I know what that is. But then is t squared, and t is an unknown. So I don't know what t is, so this equation is pretty worthless also. And then my third one, I have velocity, final velocity, initial velocity, acceleration, and change in position. So I know all of those things. Final velocity, initial velocity, acceleration, except for change in position, which is what I'm looking for. So that means that this is going to be the equation that I need to select to solve this problem. So our next step is going to be to go ahead and solve now that I've chosen my equation. So I've got v squared equals my initial velocity squared plus 2a delta x. So now it just becomes an algebra problem. I am solving for delta x. So now I'm going to do some algebra. I want to isolate delta x on one side of the equation. Um, so first I'm going to subtract both sides by this initial velocity term right there which just cancels that out. But I gotta do the same thing to both sides, so I now have my final velocity squared minus my initial velocity squared is equal to 2a delta x, and I'm gonna divide both sides by 2a, so those cancel, and I now get delta x by itself is gonna be equal to final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared divided by 2a. So now, this would be a perfectly reasonable solution on a test if I didn't give you numbers. However, I do give you numbers, so now the only thing left to do is to plug in your final velocity, which is zero, your initial velocity, which is 27.8 meters per second, your acceleration, which is negative 8.2 meters per second squared, and get an answer. So I'll let you do your calculator work on your own. When I plug that into my calculator with my numbers in it, I got 47.1 meters. So that means that the total change in position is going to be 47.1 meters plus what I got for the first part of the problem, which was 19.5 meters, which works out to 66.6 .6 meters. So that's my final answer. It's kind of an ominous number for the dog, considering there's three sixes there, but hey, that's the way it goes. Now, part B might be, does the dog get hit? And that would depend on how far apart they were. So now, of course, if I was doing my work on a test, you can see that right here, um, I've shown all of my work, including uh, what my unknowns and my givens are. I've got the first part of the problem, I've got the second part of the problem solution, and then I have my final answer and I show lots of work. If you have some situation like this and it's on the AP exam, you can see I have many things boxed just because I'm in the habit of doing that. I want to make it very clear for the grader that this is my final answer. So I might want to write on here something like final change in position or here's the answer or put some nice arrows that say here it is or something like that. So now let's take a look at the next one. Hopefully this will be a little bit easier. So now we've got a car initially moving at 17.1 meters per second, undergoes a two second time period of constant acceleration during which it travels 63.5 meters. At what rate was the car accelerating? So remember, anytime you're using kinematics, these are all based on velocity versus time graphs where the graph looks like something like either that or that, or that. The key here is that all of these lines are linear functions. So if this is velocity versus time, the slope of this is your acceleration. And remember, the only way those kinematics equations work are if these are straight lines, because that's how we derived them, was by looking at linear functions. 
So let's take a look here. So first of all, what are our givens? So I'm going to make my chart that I make pretty much every time. I have my initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, time, and how about change in position? So do I know my initial velocity? It says 17.1 meters per second. Um, undergoes a two-second period of constant acceleration, so that would be time, two seconds and it travels 63.5 meters, so that would be a change in position. Now, that's all they give me, so that means acceleration is an unknown and final velocity is an unknown, and based on what they tell me, it says at what rate is the car accelerating, this is the unknown that I'm concerned with, that's my final solution is what I'm trying to find, is acceleration. So I've identified my givens, my unknowns, and now the next step is to choose an equation. So we go back to our kinematics equations, so here are my three equations, and now I have to choose the one that I can use to find my answer. So I'm looking for acceleration, and I don't know final velocity, but I know everything else. So this equation right here has acceleration in it, but I do not know what that velocity is, so that's not very useful yet. This one right here has acceleration, it has time, it has initial velocity, does not have final velocity in it, so this is probably the one I'm going to use, but let's double check. This one down here has acceleration, which I'm looking for, but it has final velocity, which I don't know. So when I'm looking through these, I'm eliminating those two equations. This is the one that I'm going to use. So now my next step is to solve that equation for acceleration. So I'm looking for acceleration, so I'm trying to isolate that variable. First thing I'm going to do is subtract initial velocity times time from both sides. That's going to cancel. And I'm going to get delta x minus initial velocity times time equals 1 half a t squared. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 1 half t squared. So that cancels with all of these. Got to do the same thing over here. 1 half t squared. I'm running out of room on my page. And I get my new equation, which is a equals whatever delta x minus initial velocity times t divided by t squared over 2, or 1 half t squared. Now, if I didn't give you any numbers on this, you wouldn't want to leave this as an improper fraction where you have a, a fraction in the denominator. You would want to kind of, well, you would want to simplify that. And the way you do that is remember if you're div dividing by something down here, it's the same as multiplying it on the top. So I'm going to go ahead and correct that. Get rid of that 2. And just multiply by that on the top. Okay, so there's my equation that I've solved for. This would be my acceptable answer if there were no uh, numbers in the problem, but since there are, I'm going to now plug in my numbers and get a solution on my calculator. So now after doing uh, some calculator work, what I get for an acceleration is 14.7 meters per second squared. Now, one thing you can always do if you're wondering if you did something right is you can check your units. If I have acceleration, I should have meters per second squared. So look at our initial equation. We have a change in position, which is going to be meters, minus velocity times time, which will give you meters. And if you're subtracting, those meters aren't going to cancel. So I'm going to have meters on the top of my fraction, and then I'm going to have second squared in the bot bottom, which is meters per second squared. So, that's a good way to check to make sure you have it right. If you don't have it right, you probably messed up somewhere in your equation. But there you have it. This is my final solution. Put a nice box around it so that I know that's what you're giving me. So what we've done in this video is we have looked at how to solve kinematics equations in one dimension. And to do that, the guess method is an easy way to help keep yourself straight. But the big thing is to think about what's going on. Sometimes you have to look at a graph and there might be two parts to the motion, a constant velocity and an accelerating part. Um, it all just kind of depends. 
Sometimes you have to do a little bit of unit converting, which is a pain in the butt, but you want to just, you know, you can handle it. If you need help with that, you can ask me in class. And it's very impressive looking algebra, but it's really pretty straightforward. If I did anything on here that caused you to have any confusion or concerns, just let me know. Thanks.